<clears throat> Talk she. Recorded live. Welcome, everybody, to the Genesis Science Fiction Radio Show, a service of the BlackScienceFictionSociety.com website. Join it. Um, this is the, well, actually, it's a Friday the 13th edition of the show. This is uh, November 2015. My name is William Hayashi. I'm your host for tonight. And our esteemed guest tonight is Christine <laughs> Taylor Butler. Well, come on, you know, I think you're esteemed. Hell, when you look on, on Amazon and see how many books you've written, I think that's esteemed. Oh, well, thank but, you. But anyway, welcome to the show. Um, how, uh, how are you today? I'm good. I had not really thought about it. It's Friday the 13th, and I thought, hmm, this is a good ending to that kind of day. Well, you know, I've been uh, posting um, Harold Melvin and the Blue Notes bad luck everywhere <laughs> just to remind people. <laughs> so um, where are you coming to us from today? I'm in Kansas City, Missouri. Wow. Um, and and just to, uh, for my edification, how how's the weather down there? You know, uh, let's see, two days ago we had gale force winds. Um, today it was nice and sunny, so it's been pretty good and pretty warm. You've been okay, no injuries, no mishaps, no no wind blowing your roof off or anything? It better not. That's a new roof. No, I live in a 100-year-old <laughs> It's on the historic register, and it's brick, and, and um, we're in Tornado Alley. I figure after 100 years, if it's not down, it's not coming down. Well, you just have to be careful. I mean, you lucked out. You know, had you been had that house made of straw or sticks, <laughs> all bets are off. Um, no, so I anyway, so. yeah, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I, that, no, I said I've had one of those. I, I learned my lesson. <laughs> yeah. So welcome to the show. Um, for people who want to know, you are uh, mostly a young adult author. You write uh, textbooks. I, uh, I've got two. Excuse me. Two um, links that people want to pay attention to if they want to look at what you do. One is Christine C R I S T I N E Taylor Butler no spaces dot wordpress dot com, and then you can also just go to Christine Taylor Butler no spaces no uh, punctuation. <laughs> excuse me dot com and uh, check out your work there. So, uh, do you have any other sites that you'd like people to look? Look, uh, take a look at? No, actually everything will link from that main site, christinetaylorbutler.com. It, it just makes it easier if people get confused. Okay, cool. And, you know, you, you're you you're living kind of in the Midwest of the country, the middle of the country. Is that something, did you grow up down there or I'm someplace else? I'm a Cleveland, Ohio girl and mm-hmm. was born and raised and um I went to high school and college on the East Coast and met my husband, who is also an Ohio boy, and I love living on the East or West Coast, and he's Midwest, and um, we compromise. You know, in your love, you you compromise, Um, and he got an amazing job offer in Kansas City, and and so we moved here, and this is where we're raising our kids. Mm -hmm. And how long have you been there? We moved here in 1988. (laughs) Oh, so that's a while yet. In a while, yep. Yep, right after yeah. I got married. And so growing up in Ohio, was there anything, you know, notable about your growing up that might have led you or, or even hinted at the fact that you were going to become an author of, of these kinds of books? Yeah, you know what? We didn't have a lot of money, and we uh, we were that family where, you know, my parents were teenagers, and so we lived with my grandparents for a while. My dad was um, going to college at Case Western Reserve, so whatever money we had were, was going in tuition. Um, so I read a lot, you know, books mm-hmm. at the library, and I wrote stories all the time. The, the problem with writing is um, – you know, your family and your your neighbors and your relatives all want the best for you, and writing is not was not considered a real job. You know, no one knew a writer. So, you know, I'd write these stories and, and tuck them away, and I read all the time because when you when you don't have a lot, you can read and be anybody and go anywhere. So that was kind of always in the back of my mind, but I was good at engineering and I was good at math, and so I did the traditional thing and went to college for engineering. Um, And um, 
the writing just kind of was there in the background, but but not something I took seriously until I was older. Well, I mean, a, a library card can be one of the greatest treasures, you know, for someone who is interested in in seeing what else is going on in the world, looking at history, looking at, you know, the what ifs in, in life and things like that. And, and what's pretty cool is the fact that it led you to also write. Um, and so are we talking elementary school and grammar school? You're, you're an avid reader? Oh, all the time. You know, it, it's really interesting. I, don't, I didn't appreciate it then that there are countries where there are no libraries. You know, mm-hmm. there, there are some people who come here and go, wait, you can go to the library and borrow a book? Um, and, and, you know, a library card costs zero. And back when I was growing up, you had to have adult permission to check books out. There was a children's section and an adult section. Um, but my mother wrote a blanket permission card and, and because I was just reading everything I could get my hands on. And um, um, I think at one point, you remember way back when, when they used to have the salespeople would come to your house and sell you an encyclopedia set. And then you would pay Britannica. for installments and get one every month or every couple of months. And I thought that had to be the greatest gift was to see this encyclopedia walk in the door. So, um, you know, I'd, I'd write stories, but, you know, you don't make the connection between the books that you're reading and that there's a real person on the other end that wrote that book. No one made that connection until I was older. Yeah. Um, and, and so as did you have a particular – you know, kind of uh, favorite genre or, you know, what what kinds of books seemed to be your favorite as you were growing up? Uh, I, I was drawn to um, science fiction. I remember, you know, the first book I remember really getting excited about um, when I was out of what I call the picture book phase um, was A Wrinkle in Time. Mm-hmm. And, Me too. Um, and And just couldn't get enough of books like that, and then I remembered when I was a little bit older, um, Interview with a Vampire came out, and I remembered the library being up in arms that I even wanted to borrow a book like that. Um, and and I said, no, no, she can read that. Um, on on a religious basis or or maturation? Maturation, you know. I mm-hmm. mean, you know. Uh, the, the 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 books in the children's section are curated, and the books in the adult section are not. And so I right. think they're really worried about children reaching material that was too mature for them. And I think at one point, even when I was younger, you could get picture books, but you couldn't get older children's books because they weren't sure you were ready for that. Um, and my mother said, no, you know what, we don't censor in our household so she can – read what she wants. So I would be reading novels at the same time as I was reading um, like Bar Bar, which is a picture book, but I thought, you know what, I'm going to teach myself French reading these picture books about an uh, elephant. Um, Mm -hmm. And what I was reading in the library was infinitely more interesting than what I was reading in my classrooms. Yeah, that's... uh... Well, I think people who are avid readers, you know, people sometimes they may be introverted just because they spend a lot of time in other people's minds, you know, reading books and things like that. And and there's there's no telling what you're going to find. You know, I, I completely confounded my parents when I decided to do my eighth grade term paper on Alexander Solzhenitsyn. And they're wondering, <laughs> how the hell did he even find out who that guy was, you know? Yes, absolutely. So, yeah, and then, you know, for you, um, if you're drawn to science fiction, I mean, there's that whole what-if thing. There's also, you're probably not nearly as old as I am. I'm about, well, we don't want to tell that joke. But, um, you know, I I was, because of my father, I was inundated with the golden age of science fiction, uh-huh. you know, both books and short stories. So I think that's what what shaped, you know, my my interest. <laughs> but I, you know, I didn't write anything till 2001. So apparently, you know, I liked it, but it it didn't affect me that much. Well, but, and when you but say, we're probably oh, I'm sorry, the, go ahead. We're, we're probably on the same um, path then, because you know, I grew up with um, Outer Limits and um, me too, yeah. Lost in Space, Twilight Zone. 
you know, Rod Serling and, and all of that stuff. And then my mother would introduce me to the old black and white movies like Frankenstein. <laughs> and, and, you know, I would eat that stuff up. And, you know, I love the idea of of short stories. But, you know, you, you try to do that responsible thing. So literally we're on the same path because I, I left my job at Hallmark right at the beginning of 2000, and I sold my first book in 2003, but science fiction, especially multicultural science fiction, was really hard to sell. So Mm -hmm. I decided that what I would do is learn about the industry by writing what would sell, um, which turned out to be a lot of nonfiction for children. And, I mean... So it was a considered decision to do, you know, to kind of go the textbook route? Well, yeah, and actually textbook is probably the wrong, is probably the wrong definition, although um, you could kind of see it that way. Um, Mm -hmm. Each book that I'm doing for Scholastic is, is a standalone. So it's nonfiction that students would pull from the library when they had to do research, for instance. But, ah, okay, sure. But 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 not um, similar to a textbook where it's you know 300 pages and lots of chapters. I think um, my books tend to be about 32 pages, and um, for younger children, probably about three four hundred words. And I have to be very careful about the language I'm using and how to explain a science concept for a kid who's learning to read. And then the books I'm working on for Scholastic right Mm -hmm. now run about 3,500 words and five chapters, but still within 32 pages. Um, So I can be a little more complex about what I'm explaining. Um, Mm -hmm. So we we tend to refer to them as school and library market because that's, the division of Scholastic that you're more likely to find those books in the school and library venues than in like a Barnes and Noble, though you can get wow. them through Barnes and Noble, but they're primarily aimed at schools. And and what's the total number of books you're up to in that in that genre? Oh God, I think about seventy five. Okay, I almost said damn, but I did not. <laughs> Someone once called me a liar. I was on a radio show, and someone said, how many books do you have? And I said, I think at the time I had about 50. And he says, no, not not ones you self-published. How many has somebody bought from you? And I said, 50. And he hung up. I think he thought I was lying about it. And and, and the radio host said, no, just go to her website. And that's the reaction I get a lot is. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's great because, you know, first of all, Filling that niche is is pretty obvious, and and we have you know, we've all read about the controversies about the disproportionate amount of influence that uh, I, conservatives in Texas have over textbooks. Yeah, you know we had we had a woman who just wrote to I forget who it was one of the the bigger textbook ma- um, publishers <laughs> because. Their their history book <laughs> characterized slavery as um, migrant black people workers. being brought here as indentured servants. Yes, and and migrant workers. I think I'm looking it up. I think that was Harcourt. Harcourt, right? Yeah, and and so you know, and then let's be honest. There's there is a cadre of people in this country, a big, you know, a big group that want to whitewash slavery, you know, that want to pretend it never happened, <laughs> excuse me, for whatever reason. Um, and, and, and so if you put together textbooks that deal realistically with all manner of subjects, you know, science, social studies, literature, math, you know, all of those sorts of things, um, it's, it's obvious that there is definitely a need for and outside the textbook realm of of publishing, you know, aimed toward kids. Absolutely, and so I'll this, make a correction. This is brilliant. I apologize to Harcourt. It actually was McGraw Hill that made the mistake. Um, one of the things that we've been pushing is 
these publishers have next to no diversity on their staff. No one who could, you know, as 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 the teams are going through the book, say, you know what, this is wrong, or or this doesn't, you know, this doesn't pass muster. And and one of the things that I'm discovering about the textbook industry in general is, you know, it's a multi-billion-dollar um, industry, and. Right. Um, the people who are creating the content for textbooks are paid very poorly. Um, so, so you look at something like this, and, and, and I, you know, I have it up right now in the New York Times where, you know, um, patterns of immigration referring to African and <clears throat> American plantations as workers. Um, and um, I guess, this kid reached for a cell phone and sent a photograph to his mother along with a text message that says, we was real hard workers, wasn't we? I mean, he was making a joke to his mother, but there are other controversies around the country about opening textbooks and there are outdated images of Indians and outdated images of African Americans. Um, and it's recycled, let me not use words, it's recycled no, it's garbage it's from, from older textbooks that they are throwing in um, because it's more about the revenue they're generating mm-hmm. than about updating the content. We uh, we had a, a, a history textbook removed from the Board of Education, Chicago Board of Ed in um, for high school. I think it was 1972 because one of their big <clears throat> um, sections in there was actually entitled The White Man's Burden. Oh, God. You know, the, the burden of bringing civilization to savages across the world. You know, and um, I'm half Asian, and I know what the Chinese and the Japanese people were doing. They were in silks and, you know, had all manner of inventions and had a pretty, you know, a, a civilization that had been laudable for a couple thousand years before, you know, Europeans uh, learned how to bathe. So, yeah, you know what, I make, you know, I'm working on the second book in my series, and, and I, I do make those jokes throughout the book because I'm trying to make a point, which is mm-hmm. you know, the Mayans and the Aztecs and, and, and um, the Sumerians and all of these different civilizations around the world had, you know, complex math and science and, and building skills while Europeans were still living in the Dark Ages. So, you know, you can't look at a pyramid and you can't look at, you know, a, a Mayan structure or Angkor Wat um, in Indonesia and say these are primitive societies. They're very sophisticated societies, but that doesn't fit the narrative. Um, no, and, and, and we actually have some guy running for president who thinks that the pyramids are granaries. Yes, I love that, um, don't you? Um, and, and, and so here, and and let me just digress just for a second. I don't, I don't blame him because a whole lot of people have crazy notions. I blame the dumbasses who believe it and, and hang on to his every word. And that, that is, uh, I mean, that's a disappointment because, you know, these are grown adults who are going to be voting and, and they would, and, and the fact that they would believe something like that when just reading through your books, which are vetted, which are scholarly, and which are accurate, um, it, you know, refute that. Refute the whole notion because it's just ridiculous. But, you know, so, here's, I mean, here's what I figured. We were driving to Colorado <laughs> for a conference, mm-hmm. and you hit pockets of the United States where there's not a lot of radio stations. And one of the things that we realized driving through Kansas, which is very conservative, um, a little more conservative than Missouri is, is that there's a lot of talk radio. And there are a lot of people who um, they get an awful lot of information from venues and sources of people telling them what to think, not mm-hmm. giving them the information and letting them process it themselves. And also you will also start to notice there's a lot of mm-hmm. rhetoric from a lot of politicians going, you know, it's snobbery to say that 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 students, you know, all students will go to college. And, you know, I, I turned to my husband and I said, you do realize that the reason why there are regimes out there um, in the Middle East that don't want 
um, they're women, you know, and in a lot of cases they're, they're boys. To be educated is because when you're educated and you can read, you can get information and advocate for yourself. But if you can't do all of that, then you're reliant on someone, your minister or Rush Limbaugh or whoever it is you're listening to, to tell you what opinions you should have. And that's why you have someone like a Ben Carson appealing <laughs> to so many people because he is using a lot of biblical language, um, even even though it's you know it's it's facts that don't even need to be disputed. It's just not a fact that you know pyramids, for instance, are not granaries. Um, you know, you have someone like a Ben Carson who says, you know what, if you're not as successful as I am, it's because you didn't work hard enough, and 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 that ties into a whole pathology that 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 for me leads back to. If you don't read widely and you don't read broadly, you can't process information to determine what's true and what's not. You you take what you're given. You know, you're far more forgiving and far more eloquent and far nicer toward those people than I am. And no, I thank you for that because you know, I, <clears throat> it, it, when you when you see what the lack of education does to a society, and then you see let's say, a regime, you, you named it right, a, a regime that's endorsing that level of ignorance, um, what's sadly depressing about the whole thing is uh, it was the U.S. government, that regime under Richard Nixon, that declared war on the intelligentsia. I mean, this has been going on since 1972. And, and, and really, you know, our, our government is very happy with the ubiquity of the dumbing down of America. And for those of you who have children out there, you know, please don't don't let your kids be be intellectually stunted by that because it's just it's just not good for anybody. Well, here's, I mean, this, here's, here's go ahead. what I do. I've been you know I've been an MIT interviewer for let's say several decades, and we won't really define what that number is, but it's <laughs> what. Um, okay, go ahead. And and here in the Midwest, I remember when I applied for a job at Hallmark, they called MIT three times to verify that I wasn't lying about having graduated from the school. And and finally, MIT says, what's the matter with them? I said, it's the Midwest. You know, I'm black. I'm not supposed to have gone to a school like that. And, you know, mm-hmm. and I do know people lie about where they're going. But they said, yeah, but three times we verified you are who you are. And and. One of the things that I noted when I was raising my kids is I got a lot of pushback from parents about, you know, the fact that I wanted them to go away for college. And, and a lot of parents here, you know, I want your, I want my kid to be within 100 miles so I can drive to visit. And I said, no, I want my kids to be far enough away where I have to fly to visit. I want them to be out and independent. <clears throat> but, you know, someone says, well, you're really sl- snob because you're always pushing MIT. And I said, no, I'm not pushing MIT. I don't care if a kid goes to MIT, I care that they qualify because right. if they qualify, they're turning down full ride scholarships at, at every other school. They if they qualify, <clears throat> people are beating down the door to get to them rather than them having to take what's left over. And if they qualify, they can pick up a newspaper or they can pick up a magazine or they can go to the library and do some research and make decisions for themselves and determine if what they hear or are told on the news or by politicians is correct or just manipulation. I said, I care that they qualify so they can advocate for, the, for, for their own best interests rather, rather than be tricked into voting against their best interests, which is how um, elections are working these days. And, you know, <clears throat> I, I'm getting all these flashbacks because you sound so much like my mother. <laughs> um, well, no, I mean, um, she, her, her, she and her mother before her um, were, you know, they were all college graduates. And, you know, when you look back into the early part of this, uh, the previous century, in the 1900s, um, the, the education was recognized as a door to better things for African Americans back then. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the Chicago Defender, <clears throat> just a simple newspaper that came out in the early 1900s, that newspaper was, was bundled up and hidden and carried, uh, you know, on our railroads by black porters, black 
you know, black employees of the railroad and were actually thrown out at railroad crossings so African Americans, black folks in the South could learn to read and read something that was written by their own kind. Right. And and, and so there is there there used to be a huge recognition of exactly what education means for us as a race, for you know, us as, as people and our children. I, I don't want to say that it's less so, but it appears to be less so, mostly because uh, the, the society is trending away from reading, or it was for a while, and now it's actually trending back. So, um, yeah, you know, I, I guess I, I, I say all that because we have a grand tradition as African Americans um, to to laud and understand just what education, just what learning how to read you know, means to us. And, you know, there were people, there were blacks who were killed for learning how to read. And, and we need and, to get that point out because, um, you know, I just came back from American Association of School Librarians National Convention in um, Columbus this last weekend. And at one of my book signings, a librarian said that would I write um, – Something to students. She wanted to take a picture of a note um, that was kind of inspirational. And I had to think about it for a minute. And I wrote, you know, reading is the key to your future. I mean, it just is. You know, up until third grade, you're learning to read. But after that, you're reading to learn. You know, right. I, I even tell my daughters, you know, in college, most of what is going to be on the test wasn't in the lecture. You know, you're expected to open the textbook and go to the library and, and supplement what you're getting in the lecture. But I said beyond that, the, the whole idea of starting a business or being entrepreneurial or, or you know, if you're working for someone else, even being that employee that helps take that company to the next step is the ability to go out and see what isn't there and create it or fix mm-hmm, it. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and these days, you know, heck, I used to be able to work on my own car. I open up the hood now, and I recognize the engine. I know where to put the oil. I know the battery. The rest of that stuff, I'm thinking, holy cow. You know, it, it's the technology has changed. The, um, the the books that you have to read in order to repair a car has, has changed. Um, so reading for us is the key to everything. And, and what I tell a lot of parents is, especially black parents and rural parents and and Hispanic parents, you know, in an urban area, is even if reading is hard for you because it wasn't encouraged, one, libraries are free. Um, Audio books become a really good way for children to absorb language in context, even if they're not ready to read what it's, what the words are on the printed page. You know, you can you can create a kid in elementary school with a post high school language vocabulary if you get them listening to language all the time. Get them off the computer and get them off of a computer game and, you know, play an audio in the car, play an audio at bathtub, read um, in the evening because it will determine everything going forward. And if you can't afford to buy a book, I know families, you know, where food and and utilities are the priority, get a library card. Make sure Mm -hmm. that is filled with books and you take them back every three weeks and you get a new set that was how we lived when i was growing up and then i waited for a library sale or went to thrift stores and bought anthologies or books but reading is everything and i mean reading a physical book not reading an app on a kindle yeah um i was fortunate enough to 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 live in the um, neighborhood that had the highest number of bookstores per capita of any other place in the United States of America. And so, you know, used books, the library, the, you know, all of those resources were something that my folks tricked me into liking. Um, and, and I don't say that in a bad way. You know, like in our hallway, upstairs hallway, we had all of the, we, we were fortunate enough to have an Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh-huh. We had a ton of Time Life series, you know, the nature series, the science series, you know, where I learned about What's the nature of time and things like that? And they tricked us. My folks tricked us because they put them right outside the bathroom. So if you wanted to take something in there to read and you didn't, you know, bring something from someplace else, you grabbed a book that you could actually learn something from. And 
you know, as as much as I joke about it, I still I am so happy they did that. I did the same thing with my kids. My kids, um, my daughter, you know, whenever you know, when, when would get up in the morning and she would pick out three books, and we would have to read those three books before she would get on with her day. You know, not real big books. You know, um, shorter. You know, just yeah, just, yeah. You know. So, um, <clears throat> trying to instill the love of reading in in kids, I still think is one of the most important things we can do. Um, and like you said, you know, a, a library card makes them makes more books accessible than you can possibly buy. Right. You know? um, and you know, so, okay. I, you know, one one of the things I was thinking before we had this phone call is um the the biggest deficit we have right now and, and you know, we might as well be blunt about it, is there are not enough mainstream books for kids of color where they are taking center stage. Um and so, you know, part of the problem is I, I wanna lead these kids to the library um, you know, and, and, you know, I'm a big fantasy buff and I'm a big sci-fi buff and you can get, you know, you can get a Hunger Games or you can get Dystopian and you can get um, Harry Potter, but, but, but kids aren't there. You know, our kids are not there. And so what we've been beating publishers up about is that at some point we can't always, you know, tell people, read a book, read a book. And, and the books continue to reinforce the concept that if there's a black person on the cover, it's a black issue book. It's going to be civil yeah. rights, it's going to be slavery, yeah. or it's going to be some book in which their race is the major source of the conflict. Um, <clears throat> but they can pick up another book and either they're going to get killed off like Rue and the Hunger Games or um, they are in the background in Harry Potter, but they're not in his inner circle. And, and and I don't think that's getting better. I think that now the new trend is, okay, let's have diversity, and diversity has meant let's have more Asian, let's have more East Indian. You know, you can look at something like Big Bang Theory, and, and my kids laugh that Big Bang Theory immediately made it clear to them why I was as messed up as I was. And I mm-hmm. was, Joe, and I said, oh, my God, those were my friends in school. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but... You know, I was at MIT, I had black friends, I had Latino friends. I'm looking at Big Bang Theory, and their comic relief, you know, is they have one Jewish guy, and then they have one guy who's East Indian, and you see no one of color. You know, they're, they're not in the cafeteria. They're, I mean, at Caltech in, in California, are you kidding me? So, so, so the next battle for um, people like us is to say that um, – Books need to look more like the new Star Wars coming out in December, <laughs> mm-hmm. which is... Oh, yeah, but look at all the whining about that nonsense. Oh, well, you saw in Hunger Games, um, if you've read the book, there is a district that is predominantly black, and there is a young girl that saves Katniss' life, and she and her partner, you know, there's two from each district, a, a, a mm-hmm. story, are, are brown, dark brown. But in, you know, when they cast someone who ends up being biracial and, and, and light skin, people are still up in arms because apparently a lot of the book's fans had read past the description and assumed that Rue was white. So I said, well, wait a minute now. You know, she's going to die. So, <laughs> you know, the, the, the white girl is still going to live at the end. But for some people, you know, erasing diversity um, is, is, is a calling. And so I look at the new Star Wars thing and I see – this, wait, this is going to be the start of white genocide, but I believe in silver linings because I don't know if it's a direct result of this backlash, but George Lucas, who is married to a beautiful black woman, just beautiful, um, you know, unambiguously black person, um, has just donated, I want to say, $10, 20000000 million to USC for scholarships to go only to... Um, Students of color in the film school, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, which is, you know, a big deal. You know, recognizing we have got to get more. You know, this does not mean that that you know white actors and directors and producers are bad. But what it does say is 
50% of all children born in the United States are an ethnic minority. Um, in a decade or so, um, white will not be the majority. It will be one of the minorities. Um, <clears throat> and that's, that's the reason why we're having so much backlash right now, too, because, um, you know, white people are, are terrified that their their built in privilege is melting away. And 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 there's 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 a psychological aspect to why they are defending it and trying to hang on to it so hard. You know, people have a tendency to believe that what they would do in a certain situation is what the other person is going to do. And we've seen how heinously non whites are treated in this country and have been for, you know, close to half a millennium. And, and whites are <clears throat> whites are terrified that you know all of their bad behaviors, all of their death, all of their murdering, all of their slighting, all of their cheating and stealing is going to come home to roost, and things are going to be as bad for them as they made it for us or Latinos or you know whomever. Well, and, and, and here's, so, where, here's where I'll, I'll mediate that a little bit because you know I have a lot of white friends, <laughs> a lot of white mentors. I don't think that I would be as well published as, as I am if I had not had so many people supporting me. What what I think is happening right now is there's a small minority, you know, just like there's a small minority in any race, there's a small minority that holds a disproportionate amount of power um, that is stoking, <clears throat> you know, I'm coughing and saying Republicans, um, that is stoking racial fear. You know that 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 is creating this. You know what? You're losing your power, and and that's actually not what is happening. What is happening is um, at some point companies, you know, and in this case publishers and movies and the media have to realize the economics are changing. Do you know what I mean? That that you've got a parent like me who is not going to keep buying books in which um, black girls don't ever get the guy. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Or if they get the guy, it's only because they're about to get pregnant and they're going to have some STD. Um, you know, I grew up with... <laughs> or, or they're going to be hooked on drugs or they're going to have to be pole dancing or whatever. Yes, no, you're right. You're absolutely right. I, w- I want to be, you know, I, yeah, yeah, I looked at, um, what do you call it, Independence Day with Will Smith. Mm-hmm. And, and I go, you know what? I'm a little tired of the pole dancing, you know, exotic dancer with a heart of gold. You know, right. she, she couldn't have been a chemist. <laughs> she couldn't have been um, a librarian. So, so where is where is the, um, you know, where, where, I'm all about breadcrumbs because I think at some point I, it's really hard to change the minds of a lot of adults. Although I think books and the media predate a shift in in um, opinions. I think if you look at the trajectory of, of the gay rights movement, movies and, and inclusion in, in Hollywood um, where people are inviting these characters into their home and getting to know them intimately on, on their TV screen and, and, and rooting for them as characters um, – it, it, it's part of the reason why there's a shift now in public opinion about the gay rights movement and the gay marriage thing is because, wait a minute, we know these people. And you have a lot of actors who have been playing um, straight parts coming out and saying, well, wait a minute, I hate to break your heart, but I'm gay. What we right. have not seen enough of is that same kind of movement, with the exception of Shonda Rhimes, <laughs> Um you know, coming out and saying, you know, here are our mainstream black characters where the purpose of the show is about their bad acts or their good acts, but it doesn't have anything to do with the race. You know, we're not making we, – we, we let them be black. So, so for instance, um, you watch How to Catch um, – How to Get Away with Murder. Mm-hmm. Okay. So she's a lawyer. She's not a black lawyer. She's a lawyer. And yet right. we can still do the scenes where Seth Lee Tyson shows up and says, hey, your kitchen is tight. And for those of us who knew what that meant, it was like, yeah, your afro's a mess. Let me fix that. And, you know, she can take off her wig and, 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 and have, <laughs> you know, kinky hair. And, and so she's still black, but her being black has nothing to do with the intrigue 
of the show and 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 we need more of that so that people start to stop assuming that well wait a minute that's the exception because the other 99% of the lax really they're you know they're they're not working or they're lazy and and you know and when i did my essay on my blog um the importance of dreaming the question that i asked is would we have fewer darren wilsons on a police force if we stop letting our children grow up in a world where only white males are the heroes and the enforcers they're the superheroes and they're the you know they're they're the good guys and even when they're the bad guys they're balanced out by even more good guys but in the movies you can look at um a blind side where a white family takes on you know a black football player and then of course he comes from a bad neighborhood where they've got guns and 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 threaten violence or you can look at Gran Torino where um you know the Mung family is is talking about what it's like to be you know Asian but at one point she's accosted by black thugs on a street corner with a gun i mean if that's the image we keep reinforcing <clears throat> which is there's a black person be afraid there's a dark black person be afraid but we're not going to show you a superhero you know we're not going to show you um people of color doing the same everyday fantastical things that everyone else gets to see then have people who grow up in an environment where the majority of people that they have lived with look like them they come into an environment where the people don't look like them and it, there's already an expectation of you are less than you know so you know I'm an MIT educated person who reads and writes children's books I shouldn't have to worry about walking out my door um so that's yeah. why I write I write because it gives me an avenue to talk to school kids I'm in libraries all the time um I started writing science fiction which was a really hard sell for a very long time um because I said I want to show kids doing something not related to race that's hopeful about the future and and also because I wanted to create a book in which <clears throat> got to be the good guys for a change. Mhm. Well, and and I I wrote I started writing for the same reason because um you know the thing that I've said mentioned in other shows is you know the, the pushback that uh Cosby had when he came out with the last version of the Cosby show where, you know, as a black doctor married to a black lawyer who had teenage kids with what were considered white problems. Right. Because, of course, no black folks ever had, you know, teenagers going through regular teenage angst. It always had to be black teenage angst, right. you know. And, and, and so one of the reasons why I started writing was I, I wanted to create, <laughs> excuse me, I did create characters you know, African-Americans who I grew up with. You know, I, I, I admit that uh, in a lot of ways I, I am rather elitist. I grew up in the University of Chicago neighborhood, and although I didn't sound like this when I was growing up then, um, there there's a lot to how my neighborhood shaped who I am today. Um, the fact that I've read a lot, you know, I had the opportunity to read a lot, you know, my folks instilled that in me. But but that's that, that's something that all of us I think as authors who may, I don't want to say that we have to because when you go and you say oh black people have to write books that do A B and C uh-huh. that's just as that's just as bad as saying we have to do something else or anything you know first of all we are not one personality collective. you know we're just as diverse as people as any other people you know some of us are went to MIT, some of us, like me, did not, you know, and some of us, some of us uh, are tradespeople, and, and, you know, the, the diversity is just as wide and just as, as uh, ubiquitous as with any other people, but yet in American culture, our memes are, are stunted, they are stereotypical, they are gross distortions of who we are as a people and and what they do the damage they do is if they're allowed to exist unchallenged our kids 
pick those up. Our kids see that. And that's one of the reasons why I, I couldn't be happier that, you know, there are kids right now who have never been alive when we didn't have a black president. Right. You know, and, and, and to see that. And then, and then you know, the, the traditional story about Michelle Nichols being asked by Martin Luther King Jr., <laughs> excuse me, not not to leave Star Trek because yeah. it was a dis- disappointing that her roles at the beginning were were so shallow, I think is probably the kindest word that I could say. But at least she didn't have a red jersey on and died in the first six, back, six minutes of the show like That's most right. black people did. I met her in Kansas City years ago. I met her, and um, and, and it didn't have a long time to talk. But I did tell her, I said, you know, when I was growing up, you were it. I mean, I think there was Julia, you know, and she played in Yeah, I was just about to mention her, yeah. You know, I knew a lot of black people worked for the government or or worked in a hospital, but I said, I'm a math and science nerd. I was was the odd kid in the neighborhood who um, was right brain, left brain, and I was taking art lessons and working on puzzles, and, and I liked all that stuff, and I said, it, in in terms of where did I fit in the universe, she was it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she looked at me and 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 said, you know, um, you know, a lot of people say that, but you really mean it. And I said, I really do mean it. Um, you, you sometimes covet what you see, but the analogy I would give you is um, I went to Rogers, Arkansas for – a week to help the library there kick off their summer reading program for kids. And I think I saw somewhere around 25 schools. I stayed at the library and the buses came to the library each day. And Mm -hmm. on Saturday, it was just a chance to talk to adults. And so a teacher came and she said, you know, I was here during the week with my class and, and I have a young Hispanic girl who's confused. And I said, sure, what can I answer? And she said, well, she, she wanted to know if you were African-American. And I said, yeah. And she, and she says, well, she wanted to know, you know, how you got into MIT. And I tried to tell her you worked hard. And she she kept saying, I don't get it. She's African-American, and it was okay. And the teacher finally said, I don't understand. And she says, does that mean a kid like me could go? So I want you to think about what century we're in. And we have thousands upon thousands of kids who are told not to dream past the end of the block. So, sometimes it's because um, their parents can't guide them. You know, that their, their parents have grown up in an era where they were told this is not for you or weren't given the educational opportunity to do something, but it wasn't a vocabulary. And, and when she found out that the teacher was working on her master, she said, can I go with you? Can I, can I, you know, you won't even know I'm there. Can I, can I just go and, and, and see what it's like to be on a college campus? And I say, you call me anytime that kid needs anything. You call me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because in middle school, I had people saying, this isn't for you. And, you know, you're in Cleveland. Go to Cuyahoga Community College or Case Western Reserve, which was not that far <laughs> from where I lived. But, but right. nobody was talking about schools outside of Cleveland, you know, the farthest you would go is, okay, you can go to Kent State or you can go to Ohio State. But I had a math teacher who said, um, here's the path I think would work for you. I'd never even heard of MIT. <laughs> here's the path I think would work for you. And and also there's a boarding school coming in to recruit and you should interview with them. I didn't even know what a boarding school was at that time. Um, yeah, okay. But 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 I ended up being the one kid they picked. You know, I didn't realize my mother was doing stuff behind the scenes because I'm now that mother that does stuff behind the scenes. Um, but I ended up going, and 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 it opened up my lens quite wide. One, you know, you, it's real true college prep. So you're reading and and preparing as if you're in college already, all through high school. But also, I was exposed to kids who grew up in 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 environments where. Yes, my parents wanted me to to do more than they had done, and they wanted me to go to college. But I was going to school with kids whose parents were running companies and 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 running countries, and 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 it has never been a question for them. Yes, you will travel around the world, and yes, you will go to college, and yes, you will do this. And 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 then I found something odd happening at my boarding school is. 
that became my new lens, and I had advisors who were saying, not for you, if you can believe that, not for you. And, oh, no, no, I can believe it, yeah. And, and, and so I'm thinking, wait a minute now, you know, I mean, you know, I went to the same high school that later produced Dan Brown of the Da Vinci Goat and Mark Zuckerberg of, um, of Facebook, and, and Facebook. I had – uh, you know, I had people saying, you know, I mean, you know, they're a lot younger than I am, uh, but I had people saying, okay, yeah, you, you know, you've, you've gotten through this high school, you're fluent in French, and, but, you know, and, and I said, well, you know what, I had this middle school teacher who said I should try for a school like MIT, and I got no multiple times, not for you, you know, you're not going to get in, I said, I'm on a dean's list, no, you're not going to get in, and if you get in, you're not going to get out. Why don't you try for Ohio State? And I said, Ohio State's a great college. It's a great college, but I'm from Ohio. So, you know, that's pretty much a given, you know, that I can get. So I applied there in Cornell, which I was also told I couldn't apply to, and and Ohio State and nothing else. I said, you know what? I guess if I don't get into the other two, I'm going to Ohio State, which is not a bad choice. And I got into all three, but, but that – that was an eye opener for me that there was still two standards. There were the standards that rich children got and there were the standards that urban black kids were getting, which is to lower your expectations. And so I began raising my children and raising their friends to raise their expectations. So out of my youngest daughter's friends group we have Duke and Stanford and NYU mm-hmm. and MIT. Mhm. You know, and I said, I don't care if you go to any of those schools. I only care that you qualify so that whatever school that you want to go to, regardless, it could be University of Missouri, whatever school that you want is beating down the doors to give you scholarship money so you can go. That's all sure. I care about, that you set your own direction and, and and we set the path for you so that it will work for you, not that you're – um, not not what's what's happening right now is black kids are often getting what's left over. Mhm. And and the thing that that what a lot of people don't realize is that I don't want to say the best of us because that's that's that is elitist. But but one of the things that African Americans are used to doing and <clears throat> conditioned to to not only do but to expect is the fact that we are conditioned to do twice as much to get half the credit. Right. And what that does is that puts us in direct competition with people who are not as, let's say, intellectually or educationally facile as we are. And so, you know, when, when they have to call three times to make sure, yeah, uh, she did go to MIT, they don't realize that not only did you actually go to MIT, but you're used to the amount of BS they're going to hand your way, and the fact of the matter is you're going to outperform just about everybody who you are put up against. And that's a surprise to them. You well, know, the I found it funny. Amorphous them, you know, you know? Like, you know, I found it funny because when I interviewed, you know, I thought, okay, my husband's relocating. Yeah, what am I going to do in the Midwest? So I thought, ah, Hallmark, they make cars. That should be fun. Um, <laughs> okay. When I did the interviews, um, I tried to be strategic. <laughs> I did. I tried to be strategic. Um, I had an interesting work background. I had no references below the director level at any okay. place that I worked. And was still struggling to get any kind of interview. Traction, and, yeah, and, right. And, and somebody, you know, here, Hallmark is not the same company now that it was back when I first moved here. But when I first moved here, I called it a cradle-to-grave company. People would just get out of high school or college and work there till retirement and, you know, get their watch and, and leave. Nobody ever left on their own volition. So sure. it's really hard to get in, and I knew that, and I loved the challenge. <laughs> um, so I asked for a reference from – um, one of my bosses at Harvard, whose um, college roommate was um, chief legal counsel at, at Hallmark. And mm-hmm. um, it took some arm twisting to get that appointment, um, even with a referral. You know, the guy was never around. Um, but he finally, you know, we had a brief meeting and he wrote on my resume, referred by, you know, X. And all of a sudden, the skies opened up, and, and everybody at Hallmark wanted to interview me. But 
one of the things that I noticed in every single interview is that the interviewers would always say at the end of the interview, you're so articulate. Oh, no. Ooh, yeah, I said, yeah. um, okay. I said, I, I'm going to do something really unusual for an interview. Um, I want you to hire the real me and not the interview version. I said, so what you see is what you get. And here's the question I'm now going to ask you. Do you say that to every interview applicant or just the black ones? And then people would just look at me and I said, I'm telling you, I don't want you to hire a figment of your or my imagination. I'm blunt. I said, but mm-hmm. every single, every you, know, every, you know, every time someone said that, I would say, do you ask everybody that or just me? I said, because... Uh, two degrees from MIT, I'm an officer of Harvard University, and every single one of my references is a director. I said, mm-hmm. so what did you expect me to talk like? And and then finally I met a, a black interviewer who is, is still my friend to this day, and, and, and she kind of gave me the rundown. And and the reality is I had not, I'd lived on the East Coast for so long, I had not adjusted to Midwest mentality, um, they didn't mean it as an insult. They were surprised. I don't know why. Um, I don't know what they were expecting. Um, but, you know, you realize that this, this comes back to, you know, I live in a part of the country where it's a little more enlightened now than it was when we first moved here. But in general, you know, my daughters are getting the same reaction. They both speak more than one language. They have traveled because I have pushed that. Um, they traveled independently when Midwest parents were saying, I don't know how you can let your kid go live in another country when she's only 15. And I'm going, because, uh, you know, staying here in Kansas City is the equivalent of child abuse, given the school district. So, so there you go. Um, but, I, you know, I had to school my children about that experience at Hallmark, and I said the, the reality is I don't know what your job competition is going to be, but I gave you mainstream names, and they're not going to see, based on your resume or your accents, they're not going to see the black coming until it walks in the door. I said, you, d- you have to be better. You know, you have, to, you have to exceed their expectations just to get um, the interview, but... The caveat is you will never do anything that is not something you are passionate about. But if you are passionate about it, my job as your mom is to get those roadblocks out of the way. Well, if you translated that into um, publishing, I learned those from a book. You know, I was reading books and translating, okay, it's a white kid, but I have to translate to see myself in it. But you start learning about where the paths are, and then you have to start seeing yourself there. But, you know, kids are literal thinkers. And so I said, now what we have to do is we have to put black kids in those roles. We have to put Hispanic kids, Latino kids in those roles. We have to put Native American kids in those roles so that, these kids are being defined by something much larger than what books have have pigeonholed them you know into so that became my passion and and I you know I tell people writing is not for the faint of heart because my income stream and lack of retirement um sometimes it makes me wish for the days where I could go back into a corporate environment and and suffer the abuse and have a steady paycheck but I have the best job in the world. I get up loving what I do. I don't make as much mm-hmm. as I did before, but when you hear about kids who, after I've done a presentation, start going, you know what, maybe I could do that too. I might not get every kid, but you know what, I'm happy with one or two kids every time I go out, and I think I have more than that. You know, kids are listening, and I'm I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make the, the information accessible, and I tell them, You know, I show them my manuscript revisions and say, you know what, I have to do do do-overs like you do. And I get red marks and and corrections and and editing, and I whine about it like you do. And we're we're in the same boat together. Yeah. Um, Hang hang on a second. You're listening to the Genesis Science Fiction Radio Show, a service of the BlackScienceFictionSociety.com website. And you jumped into the middle of the show as a podcast or even logged in late. We're talking to Christine Taylor Butler. 
And um, she doesn't. She she writes an, a number of things, but what, the the thing that we've been talking about is how education and its implications for people of color have, um, I would say, affected your work. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so, it, you know, given all of the books that you've done in the uh, the learning series in uh, what do you call it? True. Uh, Let's see, I, there's a lot of series, but the one I'm best known for is True Books, which is produced by Scholastic Publishing in New York. There you go. And then, and so um, you, you talk about revenue, and it is part of publishing, and it's part of, of being a creative. And we're going to talk about your, um, your fiction in a little bit. But, you know, are, how are... I want to ask sale about sales. I don't want to be gauche about it. I'm not trying to find out about revenue. But what I'm trying to find out is what you see as um, in terms of acceptance of what you're try- what you've produced. I was going to say trying to produce, but you've produced it. And and what kind of popularity are 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 you seeing about what you've created? Um. You know, it's 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 interesting. It's all over the map. Um, first book I ever wrote, or how about this? First book I ever sold um, okay. was sold to Scholastic. Was a was an early reader called No Boys Allowed, and you know I had to come up with a concept. They said, pitch, you know, pitch us some ideas, and you know I kept thinking about my nephew, who for very many years was the only boy cousin at family reunions, and so of course, you know the girls want to play Barbies and paint nails, and he wants to go out and do bas- baseball, so he's the odd man out. So I wrote this book about a kid who you know wants to go to a jump rope contest, but you know, he's not a girl, and the girls won't you know won't engage him every time you know they're stuck or or they have a problem, and he's got the answer they they you know they kind of blow him off and and you know as all good books are, he figures out how to um enter the contest on his own and he wins and um that book sold a hundred thousand copies and I'm just now buying the rights back because it's kind of reached the end of its life but I was at a literary festival and a woman came up and said it was one of her students favorite books because he was the only boy in a blended family and so I gave her a book and she said no no I'll buy it and I said no I'm giving you a book you know because it was part of the class mm-hmm. so we can t- I said I'm going to sign this and you're going to give it to me <clears throat> so he has this book of his own to sell and, and I kept thinking, you know, I had such a wide acceptance of that particular book, um, and it probably could have sold five times the copies had Scholastic bothered to market it. Right. Um, so, so what a lot of people do is, oh, you know what, I can't wait to be published, and I'll say, you know what, <laughs> there's published and being read, and if you're you're not, you know, out there developing the market, you know, your book is going to die. Um, in this case, um, the book was written for a very specific um, school and library market. That's how it, so you can buy you could buy it through Amazon, you could buy it through Barnes and Noble, but it was pushed primarily through school and library markets. It, it entered the Read 180 program, which meant classes were then ordering it as classroom sets. So it sold a hundred thousand copies, but I could probably comfortably say probably a half a million kids have read that book. Mm-hmm. Um, um, you know, but but those kinds of books don't make you rich. You know, the publishers find every possible way to reduce the amount of royalties that they send you on a book. Um, but, you know, I wasn't writing to get rich or to make a lot of royalties. I was writing to create literature for kids that let them see themselves in a different way. So um, that book is done really well, and the second one is done really well. Well, there's a there's a there's another type of market that that people discount, which is um, we call it work for hire. And so if you look at my nonfiction, and I've done a book on meteorology or hydrology, I do those on contract for Scholastic. So they pay me a flat fee, and I won't say what it is. Um, but they pay me a flat fee, and then they can sell as many or as few books as they want, and I'm not worried about 
you know, every year whether or not I'm going to get a royalty check. You know, we have an agreement on what is fair to produce those books because once they reach the end of their life, you know, particularly if it's a planet book and then they discover yet another moon, then (laughs) it's absolutely got to redo the book. Um, Libraries and schools don't buy another copy of that book. They buy an updated book. So how I got to 75 books was I did a lot of contract work. And, you know, when I'm in schools and libraries, they don't care whether I'm royalty or not. They care that this is um, a legitimate published book at a respected publishing house. So I've had authors come up and say, I don't understand how you can do that. I would never do that kind of book where I would give up the rights to my copyright And so I was at a conference once, and I told people how much I had made cumulatively on the books, which I won't say on a radio show. Everyone who was getting ready to leave sat back down. I said, I bought a car for my kid when she was in college. You know, my husband, I took him on into Hawaii. My daughter studied in Italy. Um, I have put my kids through private school. I said, I am not rich, (laughs) um, but I'm not starving. And I said, so, while you poo-poo the way that I do, and and really it's not all of the nonfiction, it's just some of it. I said, tell me how many books you've sold and how much money you've made. No one could say anything to me after that. And I said, see, the whole point of the process is, are you writing a book because you want to be famous? Are you writing a book because you can't not write when you get up in the morning? It's, 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 It's this passion that fuels you. I said, I'm an engineer. I said, you know what, if I can write nonfiction that's interesting to me, it'll be interesting to to a kid because I grew up when nonfiction was encyclopedic and boring. Scholastic will call and say, here's the title. I'm free to put in that book what I see fit to put in that book because I know their specs well enough to know here's the basic information that needs to be in there. And, for instance, with Rosa Parks, yeah, let me also put in the fact that she had a really good right cross. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And she decked him. She was not a passive woman, you know. Um, you know, she was very headstrong. You know, the 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 myth about Rosa Parks doesn't fit. And Scholastic seems to be really pleased with the work because they call every year and say, "Okay, here's more titles." And I've had other publishers stumble on my website and say, "You know what? You write in our sweet spot." And you know, I have a new publisher that's well known. Um, that pays three times more more than Scholastic, literally, for the same content. Mm-hmm. Sure. So um, and, and, I make it work. But you, yeah, and, and you're fortunate enough that your business model, um, it's not the usual business model because um, there are not very many black authors who are, are into, and I, I say boilerplate with the highest respect, but boilerplate nonfiction. Uh-huh. So what you, what you've done is you have captured a niche in an area that that has done you quite well, and and I I I like that you've done it. I also like what you said to those people because you know we authors are very needy people. Okay, <laughs> we're insecure. Well, no, it's true. We're we're trolls. We're we're we should be under a bridge someplace so that we don't interface with regular society because we're not like regular people. Um, and, and I say that mostly in, in humor, but the fact of the matter is if, if, you're, if you're an author and you want to break out in, in any genre, you have to fill that niche well. And then, of course, the, the biggest part is trying to attain the visibility that takes you places. So there, there's a whole lot of things along the way that that impact exactly how well you do. Um, I I think what you settled on was brilliant because you know not only do you get to impact young minds, but you can sneak little things. I mean, what, just the one thing talking about Rosa Parks saying, you know, hey, I'm not getting up, and I suggest you step off before I knock you down. Right. You know, to to paint that picture is is needful. And it's also interesting because, you know, let's say a kid reads your book and then, you know, they, they have the, the standard, you know, passive uh, sitting around linking arms, we shall overcome in the bus in their textbook. You know, not only does that, does that excite someone's mind because they see something different and, and here's a woman who stood up for herself, but I think it also 
is is going to incite conversation that never would have happened otherwise. Yeah, I think um, so. You know, I I um um when I wrote the Michelle Obama book, you know, it's funny because I you know I said I'm I won't do civil rights books. I think you know February has become Black Oppression Month, and I said I won't do civil rights. <laughs> books. And my daughter called, okay. and I had just taken the contract for both of those, and and she says, "Why are you doing that?" And uh, first off, I said, "Do you or do you not need a car to drive to your unpaid internship?" in film and it's like, oh, and, and do yes. you not have to put gas in it yeah exactly <laughs> said um you know i get you four wheels and an engine i don't know how much more i can get you but you know books <laughs> for how you're getting through school right now um sure but also because scholastic said you know um, and the editor i was working with um you have to give a shout out to editorial directions in chicago which now edits a lot of my books for scholastic um mm-hmm. and they are marvelous to work with um, you know, said, yeah, you know, we trust you to put what you want in there. Well, you know, Michelle Obama's smarter than her husband. I mean, he's pretty smart, but, you know, people forget he worked for her when they first met. You know, she, she's not that typical first lady. You know, she's doing a very good job of, of letting him be center stage, but she has all of the skills and smarts to be president in her own right. And so I wanted to write a book about a, a woman who was extremely headstrong, and right. you know, and 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 didn't put up with some of the the, the racial issues when she was at Princeton, um, but but is really smart. You know, she just really um, has has a has a strength that I really admire because I think kids need to do that. And I worked on. Um, Sacred Mountain for um, a, a different publisher, and and that one I do own the copyrights for, um, mm-hmm. get royalties on them. But I wrote a book based on what they asked for, which was, you know, the geology and and the geography and the history. And um, about a week, I worked on it for about a year, and then a week before the deadline, I said, "Throw it out," and she goes, "What?" I said throw it out, I'm starting over. And she said, why? And I said, you know, I read through a lot of primary research when I'm when I'm writing a children's book. You know, I research it like I'm writing an adult book. And I sure. read a letter by the British. And, you know, the British were really, really hard on the Sherpa when they were climbing that mountain. They really treated the Sherpa like beasts of burden. And, and they were kind of racist. And... Mm-hmm. Um, the Sherpa had this epiphany because there was a year. You only got one climbing permit per year, and one year the British were too late. The Swiss had already gotten a climbing permit. And they treated the Sherpa like equals. You know, they did the ceremonies, and they drank the tea, and they made sure everyone had the same climbing equipment as the Swiss. So when the next year the British had the permit, the Sherpa didn't want to go up. You know, they they, they weren't going to do it. Um um, because they were, you know, they were they were forced to sleep in a barn-like situation, and they weren't given any of equipment until they came <clears> out. <throat> but there was a year I can't remember what year it was, but it was several years before they actually reached the summit that they caused an avalanche, which caused a number of Sherpa to be swept away to their death. And the 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 expedition leader at the time was a guy, Colonel Hunt, who wrote home to his wife, "Thank God, no British were killed." And I, you know, I sat there pondering that statement for a while, <laughs> and I said, "Throw the book out. I'm starting over." And she says, "What?" I said, "It's no longer called Mount Everest. It's going to be Sacred Mountain. This is a mountain these people consider to be sacred. You know, right. they believe their gods still live there. The only <laughs> reason why they are doing this job, as dangerous as it is, is because it is the only way for them to generate enough money to send their kids away to school mm-hmm. and i said think about that we can't get you know american parents to go a mile to a parent teacher conference but these people are climbing a mountain that is six miles above sea level and the last thousand feet are the death zone you can't live up there they are so strong they can without oh you know without hauling everybody else's stuff can climb that mountain i think the record's eight hours you know, it takes other people two months to climb them out. They can do it eight hours. Um, I said, and they can do it without extra oxygen. I said, these guys are superheroes. So we are going to change this book 
and I'll keep the geology and the geography. We're going to talk about the history of the mountain, not from the foreign climbers that went up, but from the perspective of the Sherpa who have been hauling their asses up there. So sure. um, so that is the book that went on to get lots of notes <laughs> and, and lots of awards, and Smithsonian liked it. And I said, really, you know, the, the passion is, we need to stop telling kids lies and we need to start telling them the truth. You know, this is how the world really works. And the people who get the least credit are the ones who are doing all the work. And and with black kids particularly, and, and Latino kids, I said, you know, we are often as a race marginalized, but, you know, the wealth of the country was built on the backs of people who were not paid or poorly paid, the Chinese. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. Africans, um, Mexicans, you know, they, they have not enjoyed the benefit of um, the riches they helped build. So, and, and, and the reason why is because just visually they can't assimilate, okay? You know, after World War II, all the projects that were built here in Chicago, you know, Cabrini Green, everything that you've heard, all the names of the projects that you've heard here were filled with white European refugees. Everything, that's who they were built for. And because of their skin color, they were allowed to assimilate. And, and because we're visually different, that doesn't happen for us, no matter what. Um, and, and, and so when you talk about being able to change the perspective of a book, first of all, your book was more historically accurate because it actually dealt with the mythos and, and the, uh, the culture that was there. But then, you know, you're going to have some, somebody come along and say, oh, well, how dare you do that? You know, look at all these white men who climbed the mountain and this and that. And, you know, there, there were jokes about Matthew Henson being the first one to the North Pole because they thought the ice was kind of thin and they'd send him out there instead of the dogs. You know, all of these things that, that have been perpetuated about non-whites' role in history you know, that's that's got to go away because you know what? It's just damaging. Well, what you it does hear is... that that um, Sir Edmund Hillary was the first right. to reach this which, the summit, and I'm convinced that he was not. And and there's actually a st- story because there's a Sherpa that dragged him up there. And right. at, at one point, um, they had a, an agreement that they would never say who got up there first ever. Mm-hmm. But all of the photos, all of them are of the Sherpa at the top of the mountain with a flag. And and what I tell school kids is that at the time, he wasn't, the, uh, Tenzing Norgay was not supposed to go up. Um, you know, his job was like everyone else, just get them over there, you know, put the logs over the big cracks of the glaciers. Um, right. And, and then you stay, you know, and, and, and you do the menial work while they go up and take the glory. Well, you know, they would go up in pairs, and then and the mountain would turn them away. And another pair would go up, and the mountain would turn them away. And one day, Edmund Hillary was jumping over a crack in the ice called the atom bomb. I think that's it. I'm doing this from memory. And he um, missed. You know, and you know when I'm doing classroom, I, yeah, I'm demonstrating, and I'm saying, you know what? If you land well, you survive. If you land on the edge, you know, that's not a good thing. But he was other to the Sherpa who, you know, with his quick thinking, you know, drove his pickaxe and I saved the guy's life and, 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 right. and called him to safety. And and so Edmund Hillary goes back to Colonel Hunt and says, you know what, I don't think we can do this without the Sherpa. So Hunt sends them last. says, yeah, you know what, you know, you want to go up with that guy, great, but you go last. Um, and, and they're the first pair to make it, but only after – waiting for an hour. Now, you set out at midnight, so it's dark as I don't know what. And mm-hmm. um, Edmund Hillary had taken off his boots, so it took a while in that thin atmosphere to, you know, to light a fire and, and thaw them out. But when he's asked why there are no pictures of him up at the top of the mountain, only Tenzing Norgay, he goes, well, you know what, I didn't have the time to teach him how to use the camera. And I don't know about you. <laughs> But when I was in Alaska thinking I would never get to go back, it's a once in a lifetime trip, I took no manner of pictures of me and my husband in Alaska and the same way anywhere we go. So I said, You've been trying for years to reach the summit and you're telling me once up there you don't wanna teach this guy how to click a button. Right. <laughs> I'm not believing right. it. And so, um, 
they had this agreement that they weren't going to say who went up first. And I read a story about the sons who are still alive and one's at the American American Himalayan Foundation in, in San Francisco. You know, when it, when the father was dying, said, you know, who got up there first? And, you know, the Sherpa are very um, humble. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What does it matter? We got there together. After he died... Um, Edmund Hillary said, "Well, you know what? I didn't. I didn't want to brag, but you know, it was me that got up there first. Well, okay. So shortly after that, his wife and daughter are visiting, and you have to come in on Lukla Airstrip, which is considered one of the most dangerous airstrips in, in the world, you know, um, mm-hmm. because it actually inclines. So you come in on this short, so and then it inclines to, to slow down the plane." Um, So his wife and daughter were visiting, and when they were leaving, someone forgot to untether one of the the ropes on the plane, and it took off and crashed into the mountain, killed his wife and daughter. And and the feeling was he had not been humbled because to climb Mount Everest, you have to pray with the with the you know um, the local priest there. You have to you have to pray to go up the mountain, and you have to have permission to go up the mountain. And he had not been respectful. And so the mountain took his wife and, and daughter, and um, and it broke him. I think it really broke him. Um, so you know, I look at this and I and and I tell the perspective of you know here are the people who have lived in this environment for so long, they're almost like superheroes, and we've got to stop concentrating on the tourists who go up there and leave their trash and their. You know, I mean, you, you know, there are blind people going up, and I, you know, I'm the first person to be married. On, I said, you know what? The mountain looks like a big trash heap. <clears throat> We're not respectful. Right. But I also wanted black kids, in particular, to understand there are legions of other cultures who are mistreated. You know, so this is not a get over it. This is an understanding. This is a shared experience that you have the strength and you have the knowledge and you're doing the backbreaking work and you don't get credit for it. Um, right. Um, so, so process that, you know, and instead of us doing Black History Month, let's talk about what do you do better and then be better at it, you know, do that thing. Mm-hmm. So that's mm-hmm. what writing does. Is it's, it's What I'm trying to do is, is I'm trying to open up the same kind of window for kids that was opened for me when I was reading. Right. And that's tough to do because it, just in general, <clears throat> excuse me, the emphasis on reading is not what it was when you and I were growing up. All right, before we get too much further along, let's talk about your fiction, okay? Um, you know, The Lost Tribes, uh, most notably, um, can you tell us two things? First of all, uh, tell us when you wrote it, you know, and about where in your, your author's past path. It came, and then what? What what was the basis for the story? Ah, okay. Um, I started writing the Lost Tribes in two thousand and one. If I could have only published a single book or series in my entire life, that was the book that I most wanted to publish. Mm -hmm. Um, I was playing around with a picture book concept that a Random House editor read and said, you know, this would be interesting as a novel. And I thought, oh, God, novel, that's a lot of work. <laughs> you know, picture books are 32 pages, 500 words, I can manage that. But, you know, 50,000 words, hmm, I'm not sure. And one day I was playing around with a hieroglyphic type font on my computer and had this idea about a kid who desperately wants an adventure and then one day his uncle shows up and and gives him a challenge, and the first challenge is a hieroglyphic password he can't solve. And okay. and, and went to a conference and, with this idea and and chapters, and and it started to grow, and 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 got some mentors there. So I have been working on this project for fourteen years. Um, got an agent for a while. Um, no publisher wanted to touch it. <laughs> That was the well, era where blacks don't buy books and white kids will not buy a book that features an African-American kid. So it kept going out and we kept hearing, 
well written, you know, beautiful language. I was like, well, I hope so. I have really good mentors in the business who have award winning authors under their belt. But publishers would not touch it. So it's 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 been a a, a journey trying to find someone who understood it. Mhm. And when um when you did finally get it, did you have, I I'm I'm not looking at it right here. Did you get a publisher or did you self publish? No, I actually have a publisher. It's interesting. Um, the young woman who was my editor at Scholastic. Um, mhm. Um, actually, she is the person who dragged me kicking and screaming into writing nonfiction for her. And after she left the company, um, they kept hiring me to write nonfiction for them. Um, she has a son, and she was really kind of disheartened by the lack of books available for for boys, you know, that like to read prolifically like he did. You know, the publishing sure. tends to acknowledge that girls read a lot, but there there's not as much emphasis on, on boys. And then she wanted to, you know, look for fiction that her son would enjoy. And she called one day and said, I'm starting a publishing company, and and I want the book. You know, she had read it. Um, the division of Scholastic that she was working in at the time didn't do novels. Um, right. But she had read it, and, and she says, you know, I'm still thinking about that book. And I said um, – this is going to be the oddest response that you've ever gotten from an author, but no, <laughs> you can't have it. And she said, why? And I said, um, one, I only know you as a nonfiction editor. I said, this is science fiction. And, and I have other editors that, you know, love science fiction. I said, but you're a small company and this will break you. You know, it, it will really break you. And uh, because it's a big project and it's a four book series and, you know, I tell kids when I'm in school visits, you know, that she's younger than me, but she has that mom voice. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, and, and when you get the mom voice, you're like, yes, ma'am. And I right. sent it in, and, and it was interesting because I still have a copy of every rejection I've ever gotten. I think I got a really good read at Disney, um, but Disney said, you know, we're, we're, we've got this other series with a gaming component in it, and, and I thought that was fair game. Um and I think I had one other really good read, but but for the most part, you have to realize that this book featured, you know, an African American protagonist and his sister, and then a, a Native American friend and a, and a kid from Guatemala and a kid from Tibet, and and they're off on this adventure. And because I'm a, a, a scientist, there's a lot of science fiction in here that's actually real nonfiction, and. Um, and, and and people didn't get it. They didn't get the voice. They didn't get the rhythms. You know, um, one editor at Random House complained that there was sibling rivalry, and why was that? And I said, because they're siblings. <laughs> Does it have to be a reason why they're five years apart and they don't get along, other than they're siblings? And and so when Eileen got it, you know, I, I was kind of a little nervous about it. And what I didn't realize Eileen had done was um, – she had made a connection with a customer relations manager at Barnes & Noble who gave her the name of middle school librarians who would read the the manuscripts coming into her publishing sure. house. And when I figured that out, I put a fake name on it. And she said, "Why are you doing this?" And I and, and I'll tell you this story. I might have said it on the on the the website. Um my agent sent the book to Random House, and I thought that was an appropriate place for it to be because the origins of this whole story was because uh, an editor, Skylar Hook, had read my picture book and said this should be a novel, you know, about mm-hmm. who think their their parents are, 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 are not really human. And, and, and the editor really liked it, and I was getting notes back from my agent about how much she liked it, and I realized, wait a minute, there's a, a writing conference in Cleveland. So I'm going to go up, and, you know, it's, it's a quick Southwest flight to go up, and the conference is right there at the, the Sheridan. So I don't even have to go into town. And, and so the editor, uh, which was not Skyler, um, said how excited she was to meet me. And she, you know, she couldn't wait. She liked, you know, what she'd read and, and was excited to meet me. So I flew up there. It was something I really couldn't afford to do. It was my daughter's birthday, but I was excited. Stupid me. 
And I went up there, and um, she didn't come down the first day, and it turned out that, um, you know, it was an evening session, and she wasn't supposed to be on, so she was in her room. But she came down the next day, and, I, and, and there was a line of people to go up and meet her, and I said, would you like to have coffee? And she says, no, I, you know, I'm really busy. And I said, N- no, you don't understand. You know, you've already talked to my agent, and we talked about my coming up, and, and, and we're supposed to go have coffee. And she said, who are you? And I told her my name, and you could see the light in her eyes die. And the minute that happened, all I'm thinking of is how much I had spent on airfare and hotel to come to a conference where somebody who was really excited about my book is no longer excited. So I called my agent. I'm just, I'm in tears. I'm calling. And I said, the book is dead. And she says, no, no, she really likes the book. You know, she really liked it. I said, it's dead. And she says, how do you know that? I said, she didn't know I was a black author. And she says, well, what difference does that make? I said, it makes every difference. I said, because, you know, you know, my agent at the time was white. And I said, I've been telling you this for years that the editors who have had the courage to talk to me when no one else is around has said that those books get shelved in the African-American section of a bookstore. If I'm white and writing about an African-American character, it is a mainstream book. If I am black and writing about an African-American character, it's a niche market for those people, and it's not going to have many sales, and the marketing plan is just going to go away. And sure enough, one week later, she got a rejection from that same editor saying, you know, on second thought, she's not as good a writer as we thought. Now, you have to understand at the time that I have as a mentor a Newbery Award-winning author, I have um, an editor at another publishing house who um, is not my official editor but has meant, been mentoring me and, 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 you know, kicking me in the rear end um, and improving the writing for years. So it's, it's no different than me going into Hallmark with no references below the director level. I don't have other people who want to write, I have people who are already industry standard, you know, sure. acknowledged, working on this project, <clears throat> and they are giving my agent, they're distraught, so they're giving my agent reference points and where to take the book, and it's a non-starter until we meet Kelly Martin at Disney, and she is working for what was Hyperion Imprint, which does the Rick Reardon series, very excited. We hit it off really well, and then my agent waited months to send it, saying, well, I want to wait till they send me back, you know, decisions on other authors. So by the time she sends it, Kelly's gone and I don't have an advocate. But Disney, eight months later, said, you know, we read it cover to cover. You know, we really, really like it. It's exciting. But, you know, we've got something else in the works called dysphoria or something. And I thought, no harm, no foul. But, you know, we got more rejections, and I knew what the rejections meant, so I put it in a drawer for a while, stopped working on it, and I just said, you know what, you get to the point where you get so beaten down by a system that won't even acknowledge the existence of kids. And then Eileen came along, and I realized that sometimes um, when the universe says no, what they're really saying is not yet and not this right. one. Because Eileen got every joke. Because she had been my nonfiction editor, she understood that um, – there was a lot in there that was a real, true mystery on earth so that if a kid wanted to look a little deeper, <laughs> you know, there's something, you know, the Easter Island heads are there and my GPS locations for Stonehenge are there. And um, she's a small publisher, so she doesn't have the budget that larger publishers that I work for have. And, and I didn't care. And I said, I, you know, I don't want a big advance. I, I really don't. And she went out and got the illustrator for the last Apprentice series, and he read it, and she said, you know, I can I can afford this like black and white cover that we're going to do, and he does scratch board. And he convinced her to do color, and then he convinced her to do not just the front, but the side and the back. So it looks mm-hmm, like a mm-hmm. changes and interior illustrations, and he's all in on the series. And so there is nothing cheap – about the way this book is produced. When, when I go out to conventions now, the first thing librarians say is, holy cow, look at the production values and even the quality of paper that she, she put in. And then the several bookstores have said the weight of the book is matching the weight of the story. So I think 
the universe wanted me to wait for her to leave Scholastic and, and start a, a company where she could publish that kind of book and publish it in in her mind the way a book should be published. There's sure. no, there's no cut corners on that book at all. And you know there there is a lot to be said for serendipity. You know things do happen at certain times which are either unexpected or all of a sudden you look at it and you go, oh, there must be divine intervention because, ooh, look at all the con- the confluence of things that came together to make it happen. Mm-hmm. But, but you know, sometimes it's just a matter of, of serendipitous timing. Um, and, and so, let's see, how long has Lost Tribes been out? It came out in March. She actually set the, the publication date for my book and... She has another author who who um, is based out of Alaska who wrote an action adventure book set in Alaska mm-hmm. um, on my birthday. So it came out in March, <clears throat> and she's now in her second printing. How cool is that? I'm 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 ecstatic about it. You know, we 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 got lucky. I was at a conference and everyone was asked to bring a copy of their book, and I had the um, advanced reading copy with me. So I put sure. it in the library with all the other authors' books, and right. the conference organizer <clears throat> said, um, can I take the book home? And I said, oh, yeah, sure, no problem. And we couldn't find it, so we, we, we sent an email blast to everyone after they'd gone home, and we said, you know, um, if you have it, it's okay. We just wanted to know if, if where it went. And, mm-hmm. and Chris Tebbets had been attending the conference, and he writes the middle – the middle school series with James Patterson. Okay. And and he says, oh, someone told me it was okay to take, so I took it. And I said, oh, no, 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 no problem. I'll get another copy and, and mail it out to the conference organizer. And then I got an email from him. He says, I couldn't put the book down. Mm-hmm. I said, really? He said, yes. And he says, I have a surprise for you. And he was, you know, he's on the New York Times bestseller list, and he did an interview for Barnes & Noble, and they asked you know, what was the latest, the last book he'd read, and he said, I have two. And and I think one was El Defo, about a girl who has a um, a hearing disability. And he said, okay. and then there's the Lost Tribes. And he says, you know, you're always looking for that book you can't put down, and, and this was it. And I was just, I was in tears. It was such a nice gift. So I said, would you write a blurb for the book, which he did. And then uh, another woman at that same conference called and said, I don't imagine you would want to come to Boston and and do a book signing with me. And I said, sure, um, how come? And she said, I think the kids who like my book would like your book. Well, I didn't realize Mm -hmm. at the time she's also on the New York Times bestseller list. And so I went and she book talked my book to huge crowds of her fans. Um. And, and you know that 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 is probably the kindest gift you can ever get is somebody who's already got a built-in fan base saying, you know, here's the next book that you should be a fan of. And and what I realized is uh, we went to great pains to not tell the industry when this book came out that it was multicultural. And what we figured out is the industry cares; the kids do not. They just want a good right. story. They want a good adventure. Um, and and I was at the Indian Outreach Center today, and, and one of the staff members said, you know, one of the things that we like about it is you don't beat us over the head with, you know, the race of the kids. I said, because the race isn't the issue. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, the adventure is the – I mean, the race the, the race is factor into it because you can't be from a, from a certain culture and not have that in, inform some of your decisions. But um, I just, you know, I tell teachers, you remember when reading was for fun and not for an assessment test? <laughs> and I said, oh, yeah. you know, I keep going back to um, what is the commonality among these kids? They're right. all from what I call marginalized races. Mm-hmm. One's a you know, Native American, one is Mayan, one is, you know, African American. They're, they're all from races who have been told, you're not the superheroes. And so I wrote a book in which they were all the superheroes. Very yeah. cool. Very cool. Um, and, and so let's look ahead. You know, do you, are you, you said this was a series, right? You, you huh? planned it as a series? Mm-hmm. 
Um, is that was it four books? Four I'm sorry, books. I, if, if, yeah. If I if I forget, it's because I have CRS disease, and I'm old. I'm really old. Um, but, no, I am. I'm I'm old. I'm uh, well. Never mind. I don't want to tell that joke too many times. But uh, okay. So uh, what what kind of? I mean, what obviously the book has when people read it, it fires up their imagination. Uh huh. And and not just kids, because to have two, you know, the, those two people you just spoke of, you know, um. What kind of what kind of feedback are you getting in terms? I mean, are you getting what you would consider? Uh, I would say good notice of the book. I mean, I, I want to ask you. Also, I want to ask if you don't mind saying, sure. you know, it's only been it's only been out since early in the year or earlier in the year. Um, how how are sales now having that huge boost behind you? Um. Sales slowed temporarily because we sold out the print run, and um, and and you know, luckily I I love my local Barnes and Noble got on the phone with her and said, "Honey, you know, Christmas is coming up. Let's get it. Let's get it together." Um, um, the sales have been good, and actually, the response from adults who have read it has has been um, predominantly positive. Um, okay. Um, because I wrote it at two levels, and and it was interesting. One of my tests was I um, know a bookstore owner in um, a very conservative part of Missouri, and you know, um, and and he was reading it, and he says, "Oh my God!" You know, he reads a lot. He says, "This is extraordinary. This is really extraordinary." And um, then he got to page two hundred, and and I get this message. He says, "Wait a minute, Ben is black," and I said, "Does that matter?" And he says, actually, he says, my customers will be so sucked into the mystery that by the time they get to the first mention of his race, they won't care. You know, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. it just won't matter. And he says, but what I'm, he says, what I'm fascinated by is um, you have written this at, a, at two different levels. So it's a great kid story, but, the, but there's actually a lot for adults to chew on. And I said, yes, and if you read it a second time, there is no word wasted. So even when as the book starts with a with a dinner table argument between the protagonist's parents and his uncle, I said every word uh, every word in it has meaning. And 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 I had a woman say she's actually read it twice and 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 found the same thing that once you know what the mystery is they're trying to solve, all of that discussion and all the things the parents say or don't say. It reads completely differently, and I said, "Yeah, I like books you can read a second time and go, "Well, how did I miss that?" Um, right. I had some pushback from a woman who, for better or for worse, I call a bully. Um, I'd been talking to her for two years because I knew my writing about one of the kids being from a Native American tribe was going to be an issue. Okay. And she has set herself up as the scholarly expert on um, what you can and cannot write in in a children's book. And I knew her from a period where she had made some legitimate complaints about um, authors who come in and and create a fake Native American name and claim um, essentially like a Rachel DeLezzo, you know. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. white, but I tend to be Native American, and are getting awards for their biographies about being Native American, and I say, you know, that's a legitimate complaint. But I never, ever read her blog. You know, um, she had talked to me about, you know, issues and concerns she had about her daughter's inheritance rights, and, you know, but she's, she's, um, she was from a tribe I didn't really know well, but I said, you know what, I have this one girl, and I spent two weeks on the Navajo reservation literally researching this one character, even though she's not the protagonist, because I knew there were going to be some sensitivities around it. And I'm curious right. what you think. And so she said, well, send me a book. And then I did, and she said, you know, what tribe do you belong to? And I said, you know, I have Cherokee in my background, but I identify as African-American. And, you know, I don't know what that did to the relationship, but the next thing I know, I'm Googling, you know, something, and my name pops up on her blog, and she's trashed the book. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, she's trashed the characters, and I had no right to write this, and 
um, in a really cynical move, she gave away the secret. You know, one of the book reviewers had had objected to the advanced reading copies saying right up front what the secret was because they said they thought it spoiled attention. And so we took that off of the book jacket. But but this woman just, you know, everything was a negative stereotype and, and essentially is mocking me in the book. And, and so I kind of shut down for a while and I thought, what did I get wrong? What did I do wrong? You know, who who goes to the Navajo reservation to research a character in a science fiction book? Um. So I did an interview for the local NPR affiliate, and I and, and they liked the book. And I, you know, I was still worried about this one character. And I said, "What do I do? Do I kill her off? I got to kill off a character. Maybe it's her." <laughs> oh, man. I do. I have okay. to kill off a character. Um, so I, so, but 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 you know how I said, you know, we talked about serendipity. Down the street from me, literally a mile down the street, is the oldest Indian outreach center in the country. And okay. I walked in, and I, and I you know, I, I probably had no color in the reception. I said, "What's going on?" And I said, "I don't even know what I want to ask. I just, I don't. I'm so, you know, I don't even know what it is. I don't know." And so she's, "Oh, okay. We got to get you talking to the office manager." Two hours later, we are laughing. I'm a volunteer there now. She says, "You know, who is this one woman to to speak for all of us?" Um, mm-hmm. We were talking about stereotypes. I um, She introduced me to a woman who's on the tribal roles. Um, I am going on Sunday to shoot her granddaughter as as, as the character for the book. Um, and I said, you know what? If this woman hadn't attacked me, I wouldn't have found you. And even today we were talking about um, some of the – the, the the creation myth of of different tribes, um, you know, I got fully embraced while I was there. Um, so the the problem that we've had with the book is there is still a component of, I call it, white librarians and editors who have been bullied into believing that this particular woman is the only one who can speak for all 300-plus tribes. And... Um, so we're trying to find a way to kind of counter that. The other thing that I have noticed is Kirkus did a review for the book on the trade side. So this is not the self-published side. This is the side where they select the books they want to review, and, and it's really hard to get a review. But they have taken a lot, uh, a liking for Move, which is, the, which, which is the publishing company that took all my manuscript, have really liked their books, and wrote a really good review on tribes okay. and, and are sure. really looking forward to it. But I started to notice I was ignored by Horn Book Review, and I was noticed I was ignored by School and Library Journal. Now I'm someone they know because there's 75 books out, um, and I became disturbed about that. And then I realized what we have working against us um, as African Americans, not going through a Random House or a Scholastic. If you are a small commercial press. Okay, so you are legitimate. It's not self-publishing. You know, I am not paying her. She's paying me. She goes out. So she's a legitimate press. MTV picked up on her. School and Library Journal picked up on her. But here's what I think happens, and I'm speculating. When you send a book in to be reviewed, there are lists. If you're not on the list, the books get discarded because so many people are sending their books in asking for reviews that there there is probably a staffer an intern that goes wait a minute this book this company not the author this company's not on the list so Eileen has started calling all of these companies who are going oh my god we don't know how we miss tribes but you're now on the list right um so uh, that was something she had not really thought about with the first two authors that she acquired. She has a pirate series, and she has the Alaska book. Um, but I've been in this game a little bit longer, and I was like, wait a minute now. Horn Book Review actually emailed me to ask me to write an essay for them, so I'm still trying to figure out how this book got missed. And Junior Library Guild did not pick the book up. You know, Junior Library Guild is a, is a big coup, because they piggyback onto a print run, so sure. you get a you know you get a gold seal that you can put on your book, and then they took the Alaska book and not mine. And I'm thinking, okay, I'm not figuring this out. But one of the sales rep 
you know, had met me at conferences, and she says, I'm going to do something unusual. She says, we are going to be hosting a reception, but we're also going to be hosting a book signing. I'm putting you on that list. So Mm -hmm. I am with all of these other authors who are in the Junior Library Guild program, and I am not, and I have 60 or 70 dedicated librarians and teachers who are there to meet authors, and all the books were gone except for a handful at the end of that session, and, and several librarians came up. It was like speed dating and said, we are most excited about this book than any other book we saw this evening. So Very cool. It, it's really about networking and finding <clears throat> who can unlock doors for us that are still closed. Yeah, but there's also, you know, there's the matter of persistence, too. You know, a lot of people... Um, well, okay. There's two. There's two aspects to it. Most most new authors and even some medium seasoned authors don't know the things you know about the publishing industry, and that is that is definitely a handicap. You know, you still have you still have legions of authors sending manuscripts directly to publishers and and wondering why they get them back unopened. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Or they don't get them back. Or they don't get them back at all and get no response. <laughs> and and um, you know. I, I made the joke, but it's not a joke. You know, authors are a very strange bunch. Um, I can tell right. that just by dealing with my fulfillment house because they're they're based in the Philippines. They're so obsequious because they are used to dealing with the craziest people in the world. So that's a tough thing. You know, to, you, how do you educate authors? You know, and and especially, I think it's great that you have the mental the um, mentoring mentality to help kids think about possibly following in your footsteps. Um, and, and that's a great thing because if you can help them out in those first few steps, then they don't get discouraged like so many people do. Yeah, absolutely. Um, My mother's philosophy was if you can't get through the front door, go through the back door. Always come correctly. But, you know, you know, it's kind of like Captain Kirk, I don't believe in the no-win scenario. I said, you know, and I use a lot of those analogies. And, you know, for people who don't understand that, I go, okay, so you've seen Jurassic Park, right? I said, so be a velociraptor and look for the weaknesses and the fences. I said, mm-hmm. the reality is, you know, we we've right now diversity is a thing. So all of the mainstream publishers have suddenly discovered all this talent that they've been ignoring for years. But one of the points that I'm 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 making to some of the review services is. When you have small publishers starting, so they don't have the millions of dollars of a random house and and a scholastic random house just combined with penguin, so they're now a powerhouse, but it's 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 lowered the number of venues where you can send your work because they're now sure. one conglomerate um, I said you know one one of the, the the hardest issues is is you can't say that you want diversity and where you know in particular where is the speculative fiction for children and that's diverse and and where is the science fiction for kids um you can't say that if then when publishers pop up um that you've got this gate they can't get through. You know, it, it it is meaningless for me to get an email saying, oh, look, this book got six-starred reviews if those same houses will not um, will not look at smaller publishers that clearly are legitimate or won't do the research. And there's another bigger issue, which is um, sometimes reviewers damn with faint praise. You know, a good example would be Everyone's heard of Diary of a Wimpy Kid, which has sold millions of copies. But you get the Dork Diaries, which is produced by Rachel Russell, who I consider to be the Shonda Rhimes of children's publishing. Um, and, and the early reviews on her book, which has sold 24 million copies now, is damning with faint praise. It's, it's, it's not as good. or it's, it's, There's always that little nitpick. So what oh, I do caveat. Yeah, I've been going back to the American Library Association and saying, you know what, I have sat in on lots of discussions about books and the reviews of books produced by African Americans have always been less than. It doesn't matter mm-hmm. how well the book is written. You know, you only send to love it if it's a slave book or it's a civil rights book. So we have still um, some weaknesses out there, but... But I tell people, you know, don't if, if you accept no, then the game is over. 
If you don't, well, and, and if you accept no, you, you get what you deserve. You get what you deserve. But you know what? I walked in one day, um, a librarian said, um, I got a secret for you, but you can't, you, you need to get people to come to a workshop, but you can't tell them who they're going to see. But it's this, you know, this well-known science fiction person. And, you know, I'm such a snob. I think she's talking about me. So, because she says, I want your family to be there. I'm like, hot dog. You know, we're going to have all these people. I'm going to do a book signing. And so we're having lunch. And I said, so, who's the guest? And she says, George R. R. Martin. <laughs> I got up in this restaurant and hugged her. And she says, but here's the deal. She says, you can't, we'll have 2,000 people at the library. And, and we don't want sure. We're not big enough. So you have to get writers willing to come without knowing who it is that they're going to see. You know. Right. So we do that, and it turns out the gentleman who arranged this secret free meeting, so here we are with George R. R. Martin, there's only about 70 of us, and he's reading excerpts from his yet unpublished next installment of Game of Thrones, and I am like a goddess in my, my daughter's eyes now. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. But he's reading this excerpt, and I met the gentleman who helped arrange his visit, and he goes, why aren't you in Science Fiction Writers of America? And, you know, I was so focused on getting this book out, it didn't occur to me that I now had a book that qualified. Mm -hmm. And he says, because, you know, we've got these science fiction conventions and the world convention is going to be in Kansas City in, next August. So he says, there's perks and you can be on panels if you're a member. So right. I Okay, and you know, Science Fiction Writers of America puts you through the ringer. You have to provide them with bank statements showing that you actually got an advance on your book, and um, you have to give them a copy of the signed contract. I mean, they, they don't play around um, vetting you. Um, so I did that and realized, you know what? You know, uh, J.K. Rowling's wasn't worried about getting an award from the American Library Association, and she wasn't worried. She was worried about writing a good book. Um, I'm, I'm writing because I want kids to read my book. Um, I want adults to like what I write, but I really want kids to be recommending my book to their friends. Keep your, keep your eye on the prize. Um, so I joined that and, and through that network, and then I, I was talking to Sharon Draper's agent who said, you know, Christine, there's a black science fiction group. And that's how I found you guys. Mm -hmm. And and so I, you know, I believe you you leave yourself open to the universe, and negative stuff happens. But it, the point of that stuff sometimes is to point you in the direction you're supposed to be headed. Nothing's wasted. Mhm, mm mhm, mm mhm. Mm so yeah, there you go. I wrote a, a, an action adventure book. There will be eight children by the end of the series. They're right, right, right. dealing with five. Um, um, one or one may or may not be human. We're still working on that one. Um, but the other thing that I did, which I think has the librarians turned on, is I'm actually using real puzzles and mysteries, um, and and I'm showing you how to solve them. So it's it's you can read it and not be a nerd, but if you are a nerd, there's some extra fun stuff about it. And and you know the the thing is is oftentimes we tend to underestimate the interest level and the 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 intellectual competence of kids. Yeah. And I think that I think that the fact that you don't do that, that you put it right out there and you challenge them, I think that's great because what you're doing is it, it, it's it's more than a single dimension of of interaction with the kids, with your your readers, with and, and who will probably end up being your fans. Yeah, I I, so, I assume kids are smarter than a lot of adults give them credit for. Well, they're certainly the perfect BS detectors. You know, kids know. <laughs> no, kids know when we're lying, and and when they see us do it, and they see us do it, thinking that they don't know we're doing it. You know, that's when you have trouble raising your kids. Um. So, oh, somebody asked in in the in the uh, in the chat room, are you really are you really going to, or did you kill one of the kids off <laughs> because of um, that? Okay, I, I, I will tell you that um, every kid is important, so no, I will not be killing the kids off, but I was, but I did have to kill off a major character, and, and it was, that, 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 that character was designed um, for the death to be a catalyst for something that happens in the third book, and, and, and yeah, I, I cry every time I read it. Um, it's but tough. We, 
We soft it because we don't want kids <clears throat> to be devastated. But yeah, you have to. If, if you're not crying, you don't care, and you need to care that this person died. I, I killed off a character in one of my books, and there is someone who is stalking me. Oh, really? in, in, a, in, a, in a in a fun way, not not like uh, what's her name in Misery. You know, I'm not in, in any danger of getting my ankles whacked. Uh huh. But but if you if you if you do paint uh, compelling characters and and your narrative is is very very good. People have a kind of a buy-in on those characters, and and they often feel like you know uh, you're messing with them directly, and not trying to tell a story. So I, I do understand. Um, My editor, you know, we're, we're, I was scared, and and she read through the first draft, and she said I was really sad, but I knew why you did it, and you handled it with great nuance. And and I do try to end with something heartwarming to kind of balance it out, but. I thought she was going to say, no, it's not going to work, and, and, yeah, she liked it. All right, let me try try your method because this may, in the long run, save my ankle. Um, we, we've actually seen now, before we started, you were wondering if you had two hours worth of stuff to talk about. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, look, I'm, I'm good at my job. I just wind you up and get the hell out of the way. Um, but, uh, no, I, I want to thank you um, for being on the show. Apparently Jarvis is out. I think he's out drag racing someplace in Tennessee or something. Um, and, and normally he closes out the show, but I, I, he kind of left that to me. I want to thank everybody who listened to this live, and obviously I want to thank you for being here because your story is great. And it should be an inspiration to a lot of people, even people who did not go to MIT. Um, you know, MIT to me is kind of like it's kind of like the uh, University of Chicago of the East Coast. But that's that's just me. I'm chauvinistic about my neighborhood schools. Um, but uh, the, I think your series is something that people should should take a look at. They should, especially you know, uh, if they've got kids. Because you know one of the most one of the most creative things that you can do is to fertilize an active and interested mind, and by doing that, you know this is this is how we we I think we pay it forward for our kids because you know they're not getting that same stimulation in school, and you know in 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 the cases where you have a bad school system or you have a not so great educational experience. You know, it is incumbent upon parents and even other people in your community to kind of pick up the slack. Well, I want to make a special request because people don't think of it this way. You know, not everybody has a book budget, you know, to buy a book. But mm-hmm. one of the ways that we can support African-American authors or authors in general that we like, go ask the library for it. You know, not every library will carry a book. But if they see enough demand for a book, they will get it. And and those sales for an author and for a small publisher like Move can be substantial. And in that way, you're supporting authors without necessarily having to stretch a budget to buy a book. But the industry needs to see, in general, they need to see people flooding the market, demanding these kinds of books, because it, it'll be like the show Empire. They will go where, the, where they think the money is. Right now they think that people will not buy a book with a multicultural cast, that it must have a white lead character to be successful. We need to show them that's wrong. That is true. Um, I, you know, I'm kind of running into that same thing. I had to self-publish my first book, and, and the reason, well, actually all of them, because I'm stubborn. But but the reason is, you know, there there are so many barriers to publication. There are barriers to <clears throat> excuse me, to marketing. And and like like you did, it's sometimes if you don't know what you're doing, t- not taking no for an answer is an awfully hard thing to do. Um but but you, I think your story is very inspiring and it does give people some things to think about in terms of how they can think about Mastering the system, you and know, I how they can applaud. Yeah, you. go ahead. I will tell you, science fiction of writers of America used to not accept self-published books, and now they do. I'm a member of the Authors Guild, and the Authors Guild used to say up front, "We will not accept anybody for membership who self-published," and now they will. So the landscape, you know, th- there is not the stigma about self-publishing, there were. I mean, there are people out there who self-publish badly and, and they set a bad tone for everyone. But in general, I think 
you're going to find the industry a lot more accepting because they have recognized that um, um, there's a caste system, you know, and and Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. say that only good literature is good literature because a random house or, you know, or a a Disney or someone picked it up. There's There's good literature being rejected all the time. Um, and, and what are people supposed to do? Stick it back in the drawer? Um, no. So if, if you know the business and you're getting the work edited and you've got a good cover, um, I say, you know, publish and be proud. And what we need to do now is support each other and, and get those books known and tweeted about and, um, and, and get people excited about them. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, on that note, thank you very much. I want to thank everybody who uh, checked out the, the show live. I want to thank the people who picked this up as a podcast. Um, if it wasn't for those people, we wouldn't be doing this. I want to thank Jarvis for putting the whole thing together many years ago. And I want to thank anybody who had anything to do with um, helping me become at least the general most often host of the show because this is a lot of fun to do. Um, giving up every Friday night is not so much fun, but on the other hand, I get to meet some of the best people in the world. So, again, uh, Christine, thank you very much. And uh, for those of you who want to find her, she is often hanging out at BlackScienceFictionSociety.com um, website. Join it. Check it out. There's a wealth of uh, content there that you may not find. Any- well, no, a lot of it you won't find anyplace else. And there's content there for for kids, for teens, for young adults, and for sci-fi, fantasy, and horror fans of all ages. And on that note, just hang on for a moment after I do our little pause for quiet and so that uh, they can edit the show. And if anybody in the chat room has any questions, we'll, we'll go over those. Is that okay, Christine? Yeah, it's awesome. Thank you. All right. So thank you, everybody. Remember, this show starts at 9 p.m. Eastern Time every Friday night or thereabouts. And uh, tell your friends, tell your family, and, uh, you know, please try to support the people who are the creatives uh, doing the work that they're doing. Thank you, everybody, and have a great, I guess, have a great weekend. Thank you.